Hey everyone, so welcome back. Um, I'm Douglas Johnson. I'm a spiritual teacher, a yogi, a certified Killaby Inquiries um, facilitator, an ordained minister, and um, I'm here to share with you a little bit about um, spiritual autonomy, um, authenticity, and um, these concepts today. So I hope you'll stick around. Before I get into my talk, however, I do want to thank uh, everyone who helps support me in the different ways. So there are my patrons on Patreon who actually make a monthly financial contribution. And this is so huge to helping me uh, do these talks and keep doing these talks. Then there's everyone on YouTube who likes and subscribes and comments. Those help spread the word. Um, with the YouTube algorithm. Anyway, so whatever way you support, if it's coming to class or one of those other two things online, I do appreciate it and um, it helps spread the word and the teaching and get it out there, so I appreciate that. Okay, so today I'd like to talk a little bit about what might be called spiritual autonomy. This is something that's been kind of coming up uh, lately um, with students and people that I work with <clears throat> and also in my own life to some degree this is maybe a rather advanced topic and it's one that maybe comes up for people after they've done a lot of work on embodiment so some of you may have seen my talk in the past, which was wake up and then clean up. So waking up is the enlightenment bit. <laughs> um, the spiritual awakening, this can be gradual, it can be sudden. Um, there are many different, um, some people have what's called an event awakening. They're on a retreat or they come across a, a powerful teacher or maybe they are just depressed and one day something kind of clicks for them, something snaps for them. They have a very powerful awakening experience. For other people, it's more gradual. They're doing their practices, they're doing their work, um, they're living their life, and over time they find that maybe things like spiritual scriptures and teachings that didn't used to resonate and didn't make any sense to them, over time it begins to resonate on a um, deeper level, not just intellectually. A lot of times what we resonate with intellectually is um, just stuff that our ego agrees with essentially. That could come from our conditioning growing up. If I grew up as a Christian with certain uh, teachings and certain dogma, and then a spiritual teacher comes along and just reinforces those ideas, then I might find that, you know, oh, that really resonates with me. Well, really what you're just saying is you agree with it. Or that person is reinforcing the beliefs that you already have and making you feel good about that. Very often, this isn't what I'm really speaking about. This resonance may actually go against what we've culturally been taught uh, and even spiritually again if we're in a religion an organized religion a lot of times these are much more culturally motivated than we may want to believe or at first see we might want to believe that um, you know these ancient wisdom traditions are pure and that the teaching is just um, direct pointing to spiritual reality, usually this isn't the case. I'd say maybe more than 99.999% of the time. Chances are if you're dealing with some kind of an organization or system, something like that, um, at best some things are lost in translation. Um, that's sort of the best case scenario. At worst, these um, systems and organizations actually get co-opted by the ego. Um, 
through the power structures that organize them. It's very, very, very difficult, if not maybe impossible, to create a, an organization um, with a lot of people involved that is able to stay free of um, egoic identity and, and um, dogmas starting to creep in. Um, you can see this, I mean, even in smaller organizations, religious or spiritual organizations, you can see certain ideas and dogmas start to creep in where people stop questioning things. So it's just being worth, it's worth being aware that that's uh, uh, just something that, ha it's not that anyone's being evil. It's not that anyone is, is trying to oppress anybody or hurt anybody. These are just things that happen as human beings and it's just worth being aware of them so that we can hopefully avoid them in our own uh, journey or if we notice that happening to us or to an organization that we're a part of, then we can um, be aware of it and we can take measures or steps to try and counteract this, okay? So spiritual autonomy happens after we've sort of had the enlightenment experience and I, I find probably after you've done a lot of work on embodiment. Embodiment is the cleanup part. This is the part where you might say the awakeness that we are, another word for that is just spirit, consciousness, awareness, this becomes interested in and begins moving down into the physical body, what we can call the physical body. In reality, the body doesn't exist at all the way that we conceive of it. Same with the outside world and other people. <laughs> These things aren't really real in the way that we conceive of them as human beings. But I don't want to focus too much on that in today's talk. Chances are, those of you listening to this still very much identify as a body and as an individual and you very much perceive others out there and a world out there um, and that's fine but at a certain point this can all begin to really really break down um, not conceptually just conceptually like this can actually really start to break down for us um, and so as we get interested in this embodiment in what we could call form versus the emptiness, right? So this is a Buddhist and Zen teaching. Form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. The emptiness, again, is, is an experience that, that we can have. It's a reality. It's the truth of every moment. But so is form. Um, in fact, emptiness is a type of form, we might say. So there is what we are, and then there is form and emptiness, and they are really not separate from each other. They are not separate from what we are. So as we become interested in what I might call the human who is present to each of us, what we may have formally completely identified with as our self, the small self, as we become interested in, in that and in um, cleaning that up and making that a better vessel for spirit, love, joy, peace to move through, life, it's another word I could use for life to move through. As we do this, we'll likely find, or I at least have found, and other teachers have found that all forms are limited. All forms are a limited expression of the ultimate. And there is a beauty in that. 
there is a deep, deep beauty in that. It, it, it really, it's so beautiful when, if you, what, you know, what forms do you love? Do you love your, your dog? Do you love your child? Do you love to um, hike in the woods? Do you love the beach and the waves? What forms do you experience as perfect? What experiences you have in life where you're just like, this could not get any better? These are still limited forms that you're experiencing. So whether that's the, say, the, you know, a sunset on the beach and you're like, oh my God, I'm just filled with a sense of peace and joy and oneness and goodness, the goodness of the world as I watch this sunset or sunrise on the beach. That's beautiful, but someone else might be there and not be experiencing that at all. Is that moment actually perfect? No, it's a limited experience. So the fact that we can experience perfection through that limited experience is, is very significant or important. This applies to us as well. As we work on the cleanup part and the embodiment part, we will eventually find that this limited form, so this form is called Douglas, um, we will find that this limited form has its own way of expressing the truth, the deep truth that lays behind it. Will everyone get or appreciate this? No. Just like not everyone sitting on the beach in the morning or the evening watching the sunrise or sunset is going to be filled with that experience of, oh my God, this is perfect, right? And that's just an example. Take, maybe you like to bike ride and when you're on your bike, you feel this sense of perfection sometimes. Or maybe you like to run and it's in running you experience that. Or maybe you like playing music and sometimes when you're improvising and playing music, you have these little glimpses. I, I mean, I think we all have them. And oftentimes we actually get attached to them, don't we? We very often think that there's something magical about sunsets or sunrises or biking or um, running. But again, we can take our friend, maybe a yoga retreat. Maybe you've come on yoga retreat with me or someone else and you've experienced the moment of and then you bring your friend or your family and they're like rolling their eyes. They're like, what is this? So these moments where you might say the veil gets very thin and we experience the, the truth behind all the forms, we can never expect that everyone is going to have that experience. It just, it just doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. It doesn't work that way. When Jesus was alive, not everyone saw or experienced what was radiating through him. This is true of Buddha, Mahavira, Muhammad, Moses, any great teacher. There will be people who have come across them and some people wouldn't have seen a prophet or a saint or a sage or a teacher at all. In fact, some people may have seen just the opposite. So I think I've spoken a little bit about this in the past, but in Jesus's community when he was alive, he was not seen as a great prophet, anything of the sort. Twelve followers is not a lot of people. So it was really his resurrection and that story and that myth spreading that made the masses eventually recognize perhaps what Jesus was and what he represented and to begin to tune into his teaching. 
But in his lifetime, this w isn't what most people who met him experienced. They probably saw a troublemaker, a rebel, someone who is opposing the status quo. Now, Jesus is a great example of spiritual autonomy. He was going against the power structures of his time. He put his life on the line, as we all know, and it cost him his physical life. Um, you know, depending on how you want to look at it, he, he died and was resurrected, so he, he did lose his life. But what the resurrection represented is that life is eternal. So he, in a sense, came back. He didn't die. That's really the power, one of the very powerful things about that symbolism of the resurrection. So my point is that Jesus is a great example of somebody who he was in his own way expressing and became a conduit for truth, for spirit, for God, for love, for life. Use whatever terms you want. So Jesus is a great example of spiritual autonomy. Another Western figure is Socrates, who was also uh, executed, just like Jesus was. Now, there are no stories of Socrates uh, being resurrected or coming back from the dead. Um, but regardless, Socrates was someone who was awake, enlightened. He was a teacher. Um, and the powers that be, again, he was kind of a troublemaker, just like Jesus was. And the powers that be sought or saw fit to end his life. Buddha definitely basically completely upturned the status quo of the culture he was in. Now, for whatever reason, generally speaking, in Eastern cultures, wise men like Socrates and Jesus weren't executed for whatever reason. Um, Buddha was actually revered in his lifetime, but interestingly, Buddhism pretty much completely died out in India and um, where you know he was teaching India Nepal that region so that's a very curious thing so a lot of what he taught was actually you could say appropriated by the power structures where he lived into the mainstream teaching and so a lot of what he did well, eventually sort of um, faded out. A lot of the innovations and things that he did, they were just appropriated. And then, you know, these may have been popular things people liked, but they were appropriated by the power structures that be. And so then eventually Buddhism was almost pushed out of these cultures. Buddhism spread. And so Buddhism survived in China, in Japan, in all manner of places, but not actually in the in the its birthplace, which is, again, very interesting. Um, so Buddha, another example of somebody who had spiritual autonomy. Another one is Krishna, I think, is a great example of that. Again, kind of a troublemaker. Um, he was just manifesting in his, as the avatar, manifesting truth, spirit, as an individual, very powerfully. So this is something that we might find as we work on the embodiment, that we might actually start ruffling feathers. We might actually start standing up for certain things that maybe in the past we just let go or let slide. We might have actually find ourselves becoming a little more of a rebel. We might find ourselves 
less and less concerned with whether or not we're upsetting others. And I'm, this isn't to say that we're trying to upset anybody. No, 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 no. But to some degree, if we're coming from an authentic place, if we are, again, to the best of our ability, um, allowing life and love and truth to come through us, we are less and less likely to let the ego censor or edit that so that others are comfortable with the message as it's being delivered. Again, to go back to Jesus, because he's such a powerful example, when he goes into the temple and turns over the money changers' tables, this is essentially a violent, rowdy act. I hope everyone can appreciate that. This is very much in contrast to how most of us think of spirituality or even Jesus. We might think of this peaceful, walk-on-water, saintly individual, not someone who goes into places and starts creating a, a, a ruckus. So what about you? Would you be ready to go into a public space and create a ruckus in the name of truth, in the name of love? For most of us, the answer is no. But as you begin to embody truth more and more, you might find yourself, when you're not censoring yourself, when you're not doubting yourself, when you know your true nature, you might find that you allow more and more life to move through you freely, that embodiment to move through you freely, and you might be surprised at times at what manifests and how that manifests. Now the other side of this is people's reaction to this. As I've already mentioned, Socrates and Jesus were put to death. So at least in Western culture, traditionally, very often, the enlightened perspective, the awake perspective, spirit embodied has not been embraced. Sure, after you are dead and your teachings can be appropriated, uh, your message can be appropriated, then you can be embraced. But what's really being embraced is a sort of cleaned up version of what was taught. Because again, Jesus and Socrates were no longer around to say, no, that's not what I meant. What you're teaching is not what I meant. So this is why there's this very interesting dance, at least in Western culture, where the individual, the, the messenger is killed. Then the message is received and cleaned up. It is appropriated, it is changed, it is altered so that the status quo can continue. I mean, the powers that be recognize there's something very powerful here. And so what they try and do is pull that into the structure that is going to uphold where they are. Now, again, I am not suggesting any of this is done on a conscious level. So. If you're going to go to conspiracy theories and say, oh, the Illuminati, is, this is not what I'm saying. This is just the ego at work. The collective ego, the individual ego, whatever you, however you want to see it. This is just what the ego does. It senses something very powerful in spiritual teachings and teachers. It also senses something very, very dangerous. And so what it tries to do is have the best of both worlds. So the individual who is spiritually autonomous, who is free, that person needs to be eliminated. 
Because again, once we appropriate something and we start saying, this is what Jesus meant, this is what he's teaching, if Jesus is around, Jesus can say, no, that's not what I meant at all. That's not what I was trying to teach. So you can't have that. You need to get rid of that guy. But once he's gone, then the powers that be can say, oh, this great teacher, here's what he was saying. Uphold the status quo. Don't question authority. Uh, you know, serve the, the society that you're in. Serve the powerful people that are there. And again, I'm not saying any of this is happening on a conscious level. So we don't need to go to conspiracy theories. We don't need to believe in some kind of organized human creation to do this. You don't need that. The ego just instinctively does it. So human beings who are asleep will act as a sort of hive mind and they will simply do this and they have done this throughout history easily effortlessly so again if none of this is resonating it could be because you haven't really reached or started working on embodiment you might still be working on enlightenment you may not have woken up but the fact that you're listening to this talk at all or this channel at all means that you're in that process whether you recognize it or not, you might feel like you're the most asleep person in the world, and I understand that. I've been there before. But the fact that you're here, you're listening, um, this means that something is, is stirring within you. The process has begun. It doesn't mean that it's going to finish anytime soon, <laughs> um, but something is happening in there. So... At a certain stage, a talk like this will hopefully start to make sense. The world out there, and again, I'm not suggesting it's an evil world or a bad world. I'm suggesting that it is a world ruled by what we might call unconsciousness, lack of awareness. So that world is ruled by these structures and it wants you to be small so why well think about it let's take the smallest unit social unit the family unit the nuclear family mom and dad have the the power the authority the children are expressing something, life, unbridled life, life untamed. They're loud, they're running, they're screaming. They do inappropriate things. Uh, they take off their clothes when they shouldn't. They touch their genitals when they shouldn't. They pull up their skirts when they shouldn't. Um, whatever it might be. This is sort of the uncensored, unbridled life. And I'm not suggesting that that does not need to be channeled in some way, to be harnessed in some way. But what usually happens is it gets repressed. It gets pushed down. Most parents, meaning well, so again, if you're a parent, I'm not, trying to say that you're an evildoer. But I will say most parents, especially when it comes to raising children and parenting, that they, they are very unconscious. This is just where we are right now. So this isn't a personal attack. This isn't meant um, to say you did anything wrong. This is just sort of facing facts. And maybe you were a very conscious parent. I don't know. So please don't take this personally and understand the message. But most parents, it's extremely inconvenient and maybe even dangerous for your children to just let them run free and let those energies unbridled go. 
So hopefully if you are a parent, you can recognize in yourself that desire to say, it's not safe. I can't allow my children to do whatever they want. I have to rein them in. And what do you say for their sake, right? For their safety. I have to help them fit in. I have to help them understand the world as I see it. This is a very relatable and understandable um, desire, isn't it? So all you really have to do is take that same conception and understanding that I know better than my children what they need to do and learn and how they should behave. Just take that and then transplant that same idea into the head of a president or the head of an organization, whatever it might be, right? So it's not somebody evil. You love your children. You want what's best for them. You really do. And so as you, you, the tendency again, because most of us haven't learned any better, is to simply cause repression of the energies and the expression, not a channeling. So again, governments, opposition, the tendency is to just try and shut down the opposition to pass a law, um, you know, to do something, to make something illegal, to uh, create a task force or an organization that's going to squash or um, shut down opposition. Again, usually this is for your own good. And you, I may do a separate talk on this at some point, but you really want to look out for the for your own good, for your own sake. I'm doing this for you. You also want to keep a real eye on safety. The idea that we can make life truly safe, that we know what is safe. And sometimes you have to question whether or not safety and health are in opposition. Safety and freedom are in opposition. Which one is really more important? Is it safety or freedom? I don't know. But have you ever asked this question? I can be safe or I can be free. So anyway, these are questions worth looking at. And you want to be very careful of absolutism. No one can be absolutely safe. No one can be absolutely free. These are conceptions, these are ideas. But we can move in the direction of one or the other. And like most things in life, what you tend to find is there's a balance. There's a balance. Life happens in the balance between the two extremes. So whether it's a president, a government, a religious organization, a parent or babysitter, usually our unbridled expression of who and what we really are, which children tend to be really good at, by the way, and I want to be very clear, I'm not saying you don't sometimes need to discipline your children. I'm not saying sometimes you don't need to take action to keep them safe. But oftentimes what can happen is safety and what's necessary gets confused with our own comfort. So again, we may not like our children doing certain things because of how we think it makes us look. And if you don't have a lot of awakeness, you won't be able to distinguish the difference between the two. You will likely believe that everything you're doing is for their sake and their good. This will, will be what the narrative that your ego gives you. If you have a certain level of awakeness or awareness, you might start to recognize that certain things you ask of your children 
are because when your children do those things, it embarrasses you or it makes you uncomfortable. Whether that's you're uncomfortable because you care about their safety or maybe they scream and yell at you or something and, and that makes you feel uncomfortable or angry or experience emotions that you don't like to feel. And so then when they're very young, you might be able to punish them and get them to stop doing certain kinds of behavior. Again, this leads to repression of energies and emotions that are natural for us to experience as human beings. So in general, the status quo, the world out there, other people, not because they're evil or bad, but because they lack a certain amount of awareness or awakeness they very often want us to be small, inauthentic, right? There are certain socially condoned ways of being. These may not be the way we want to be. This may not be the way the world, or our, our, rather our own energies, want to move us. So very often we find the world likes us weak, small, quiet, and inauthentic. It likes us repressing our emotions very often than not, rather than either expressing them or channeling them in healthy ways. So this is something to be aware of in ourselves as we begin to embody more and more, because you might find yourself as you come out of repression, as you begin to embody more, that you're ruffling feathers, that you're upsetting people. And when this first started happening to me, I was very shocked or surprised because I didn't feel that I was expressing or saying anything that should upset anybody. That was the furthest thing from my mind Again, some egos actually get a thrill out of upsetting people, and I don't want you to confuse these two. So again, I've given a talk a while ago about intention is everything. So you really need to be aware of intention. Are you really expressing spirit and love and then finding people getting scared or upset by that as I've said in the past this is this has happened with many teachers Jesus and Socrates being two great examples trying to express truth and point to truth to point to spirit and then having the people around you so upset by what you're doing you could say the ego understands on some level it understands that what is being point, pointed to will mean the end of it. And so if we're very strongly identified with the ego, which most people are, then instead of hearing a spiritual message or something that's uplifting or freeing, we will hear something very scary. And some of you may have heard things in this talk that felt that way that felt like a personal attack. And nothing in this talk is meant in that way. So this is just something to be aware of in your own journey. Knowing your own heart and mind, knowing your intention, where you're coming from, being clear on that, and then not being dissuaded by the structures and the powers that be I'm not advocating that you do something careless. I'm not suggesting that you do something that represents truth and then get yourself uh, put in jail or, or murdered, um, you know, executed. But I will say as those examples I gave 
demonstrated sometimes this does sometimes that is how spirit moves us and I think the more awake we are if that really is our path like it was for Jesus we can assume you could see in moments in the Bible where Jesus was sort of resisting what he knew was being asked of him those are very human moments very beautiful moments I think because Jesus is 100% divine and 100% human at the same time. So that represents really where we want to get, spiritually speaking, where we're holding both heaven and earth, as a Taoist would say. It's not heaven above earth or heaven instead of earth. It, it really is earth is heaven heaven is earth form is emptiness emptiness is form the human is divine just as a human so anyway everyone i hope that this was helpful i hope i was clear i hope nothing i said triggered you but if it did, if something I said triggered you or upset you, I hope you know how to do the work and you understand that this was not my intention. As always, if you have any questions, please reach out. If you think that I can assist you on your path in any way, help you. For many people, this requires a one-on-one, -on -one, working one-on-one -on -one with a teacher sooner or later and so if you feel that you're ready for that please reach out let me know um, i would love to assist you or help you in any way that i can anyway it's been a pleasure and until next time namaste and have a beautiful day